What's up, everybody? It's your friend Isaac, and welcome back to Big Bike BMX. We have such a cool show in store for you tonight. We've got some return guests that every time they come, you know it's a big deal. You know it's our friend Jamie and Alan. But Craig, kick us off, do all our intros, and let's get right to it. You got it, man. And first of all, Isaac, dude, I can't say enough how excited I am, too. I was telling our guests tonight that this smile has been there since I woke up this morning, knowing what we were about to get into tonight. You guys out there at Big Bike BMX, all the listeners on YouTube and in our streaming platform, Isaac's correct, man. We have such an incredible night. It's such incredible guests. We have some return guests and we have one new guest that I think you're going to be really excited to talk to and hear from. Um, you guys, please welcome to the show our friends from the Buckeye BMI, the Buckeye Bike Show out in Ohio. We've got Jamie and Alan joining us tonight, and welcome to the show for his first time, one of, if not the greatest BMX legends of all time. We've got Mr. Stuart Thompson. Stu Thompson's in the house. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Big Bike BMX. Hello. Hey, hello, everybody. Glad to be here. We're excited. We are so excited to have you. Just like Craig said, man, it's today was a long day at work, man, because it was like I'm talking to Stu tonight. Um, <laughs> Stu, I'm, uh, I, I'm sure I look familiar. We've met. We've actually met. Uh, we met uh, when I was 10 years old. I looked a little bit different, but I was wearing some brown corduroy pants. We met at the Stockton Fairgrounds BMX track uh, for whatever race that was. And you let me sit on your bike. And my mom has a Polaroid picture somewhere at her house. So uh, it's just just wanted to let you know it's good to see you again. It's been a little bit, uh, but I missed you. Been, been a few years, yes, for sure. <laughs> and, and I'll and I'll be honest to say that I probably don't remember that. Oh <laughs> no. man, right in the emotions, right here, you guys. But <laughs> but you've got, uh, you've got a photo, you've got a photo of it somewhere, so that that accounts for it. It does, it does. And you know, and, I, and I just <laughs> and those are the kind of those are the kind of photos that I like to see. When people post on Facebook, um, the, those candid shots of, of, you know, me having it like yourself sitting on a bike and then a parent takes the picture because, you know, we've we've all seen the photos in Plus and Super BMX and BMX Action and all the tabloids. We've all seen those, but it's all the ones behind the scenes that the fans take when they come to these races, you know, moons ago. Um, those are the cool ones that I like to see, you know, that, that one where the dad reaches over the, the fence line and takes a picture of a, a group of us, you know, whether it's in focus or not, but it still, it shows the action and, and the thrill of, of the fan base. 100%. Yeah, that's a, that's pretty incredible, Stu, because, um, although I don't have the honor of having, uh, sat on your bike and having a Polaroid taken, I did get some good photos of you and your motos at Frogtown. So I'm going to post those. And show you what I got because uh, I oh, think cool. you're going to like them as well. Oh, good, good. I like uh, Frogtown was fun. I tell you what, I had such a blast there. Um, I actually started getting nervous about, you know, I mean, I just wanted to go and put on a good show, whether or not I crashed or hit a jump and just made somebody ooh or ah. But then as it, you know, progressed, it's like, gosh, you know, it would be kind of nice to win this, you know. And then, and then the old, the old mindset kicks in, you get nervous, you get butterflies. You don't want to do this. You don't want to do that. And then, I don't know, it worked out for me that weekend. So. Dude, I got to tell you, I, I watched you go live, I think on Instagram or Facebook and do like the, do your rider walk where you walk the track um, yeah. at Frogtown. And it was yes. so, it was fun to watch because I've only seen your personality on interviews. And when you're interacting, usually like family on Instagram, the videos yeah. there. So watching you change your your the just your focus was a very different stew in that moment. And I thought it was so rad to see like, all right, it's go time. Like you definitely it looked like you had a lever or switch that just turned on when you saw that track. What was that like? Well, it's well, I mean, because you you gotta like I don't know, it's just a weird feeling um to reminisce back to I mean, a lot of guys don't ride. I mean, they don't walk the track anymore. I mean, we used to back in way back when the tracks were a little bit more technical, um, but nothing a good couple laps of practice wouldn't wouldn't fit in. But now, you know, it was just fun to try to pick out a line and look at soft spots and areas of the track that we're going to give away, other areas that we're going to hold up. 
um, you know, the, the iceberg rocks where there's only about, you know, two inches showing, but it's probably a giant boulder underneath it that it is never going to go anywhere. And that first, that first, I call it the first corner. So the, the sharp right hand or actually the first corner was kind of a left chicane, but you had to go around that tree. They had some crazy sharp shards of rocks just sticking out of the ground that when you go around that corner, man, you just hope you don't get a flat tire because they were gnarly. They weren't moving. They weren't budging. It was just crazy. And then at first, when I first got there, I had way too much air in my tire. So I had to end up bringing it down to, you know, like 35, 40 pounds just to soak up the bumps. But yeah, it, and it's fun to just to like pick out lines and, you know, I was maybe a little animated and, you know, speed jump and you know stay the inside and or, or go wide and but it all changes when you get you know two or three guys on each left and left and right side of you it all changes and then you just go into the you know battle mode 100 percent, yeah and you know what I, and we were going to get to our buddies over there jamie and alan in a second but what i'd want to do is segue into them uh Stu. you know one of the things that i found the most appealing um from the fan side of frogtown weekend um was watching all of the legends, all of the Hall of Famers, all the guys who participated uh, at a pro level or some level from the 80s up until today, racing in those motos, guys like yourself, Mike Miranda, Perry Kramer, and, and Tracer Finn, and, and, and Toby Henderson, and all these guys, right? Um, you know, watching you guys uh, being a part of that, what was that like for you being at Frogtown with your with your buddies again? Or I mean, is it a different thing now where it's not so much a rivalry or a or anything like that? Did, I know you were competitive there, but did you feel like, hey, I can relax a little, and I'm seeing people that I haven't been around for years? What was the vibe like for you? At, at first, it was um, like, like, yeah, cool, I'm going to have fun, chit chat, you know, but like I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the competitive side of me starts coming out and you want to start doing better and better. But, I, you know, I, I wanted to throw an elbow or cut somebody off or I wanted to follow them until the very end, pass them or or just play. You know, it was just it's more like playing, you know, some right. fun. Um, and whether it's, you know, racing, you know, Tracer or Toby and found out Toby was practicing for that event, but, <laughs> <laughs> and, and his bike his custom 26 inch race ink bike. That thing was, I think weighed probably, I don't know, 18 pounds or something like that. And probably more, but man, that thing was so light. And then yeah, he, he just, had it dialed in, man. Yeah. And then, and then he was like, we we're at the starting gate and he was like, Oh yeah. You know, I was at, I was at Bellflower doing some practicing and I looked at him. I said, what practice? I got <laughs> I, I took my bike out of the storage unit the day before I left and put air in the tires and dusted it off. <laughs> but I mean, but you know, I'll put three, 400 miles a week on the mountain bike or something like that. So it's not like I'm haven't ridden a bike. It's just changing. Um, uh, disciplines is all. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and, you know, to bring in Jamie and Alan from the Buckeye uh, bike show out there, <clears throat> what they're doing, uh, you know, aside from like a frog town event, they're really doing a whole, um, weekend as well, but on a different scale. Um, and Jamie and Alan, I, I and Stu, I kind of want them to tell us what's going on what the Buckeye Bike Show is all about, if that's okay, Isaac, and uh, just kind of intro that so we can connect the two with uh, with what's going on with Stu. Yeah, I'm excited. You guys, Jamie and Alan, every time y'all come, it's it's bangers. Like, it's you have legends of the sport, and you create an entire weekend of just immersive BMX for old nerds like Craig and I that are looking for nostalgia. You know, it's like, I'm just sitting around doing nothing. I would much rather fly to Ohio and hang out with Stu Thompson. Tell me about what you guys do and what this weekend's going to be like. Well, uh, like you mentioned, we, we host a show. And what we like to do, something different than other shows in our area in the Midwest, is we like to bring in an old-time BMX legend. Uh, 
because we want people to come not just to look out and check out the old vintage BMX bikes, but a part of that is racing and the legends who used to race back in the day. So we want to give that opportunity for people to come to the show and meet somebody who they might never get that opportunity ever again. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as you know, Arl Osborne was our first guest, and then Mike Buck was our guest last year, and now we're privileged and honored to have Stu Thompson. So I think that's what separates us from other BMX bike shows in our area, is that people get to meet someone like Stu Thompson. Like, yeah. And, and get an autograph and then get a picture taken with them and, and whatever. So but also what separates us from other bike shows in the Midwest is not only is it just a bike show and a meet and greet, but it's a three day event. Uh -huh. It's a ride out on Friday night. It's a bike show, meet, greet, swap meet on Saturday. And then Sunday is the race. So uh -huh. you could be anybody and you've got an opportunity to be at the starting gate or in the starting gate with Stu Thompson. Uh -huh. you know, so Hold, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So Sunday, you're so I, I've only known the two day thing where it's like, hey, we're doing a ride out and then, you know, the, the show's the next day. The, what What's explain? Tell me more about this race thing. What is this? I'm excited. I'm already in. Spoiler. Spoiler. <laughs> well, <there. laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just our local track is within 15, 20 minutes from the where we're hosting the show i mean we're it's all right here in dayton ohio and i talked to our local track director and he's like yeah sure no problem it's not great so i talked to Stu. Stu said yeah i'm sure no problem i'll race so we kind of put it together and we're going to promote it that Stu johnson's coming to dayton ohio to and he's going to be here on sunday to race so it's a three-day event with Stu johnson now now they race every sunday so it's a, it's a it's a sanctioned race they're just going to probably throw in an open class for us and just let us all get it into one gate and just race. Right. Yeah. I think that's incredible. Hello, everyone. I'm Alan. I'm Jamie. I'm Trent. And we are the host of the Buckeye Bike Show. This year for our 2023 show, our special guest is none other than Stu Thompson. This year we're having a silent auction and up for auction is a 2019 STR 24. It's still in the box and what's special about this is that they only made about a hundred of these and this one SE Racing sent directly to Stu Thompson. Stu Thompson gave it to us so that we could auction it off at this year's show. So one lucky person will be able to take home this bike and Stu Thompson himself is gonna autograph it to the new owner. In honor of Stu Thompson coming this year, uh, we've got two bikes that will be at the show. Uh, well, we'll have this bike up for raffle. Anybody has a chance to win this. It is a 100% all original survivor condition Huffy Stu Thompson department store bike. Um, you know, one of the things Isaac and I were talking about, you guys, was the fact that as we were growing up, um, you know, Isaac actually was a sponsored uh, freestyler when he was younger. I was just a neighborhood uh, deviant on a bike. But, uh, but you know, really, it, it's you read through magazines, you go to the store, you're, you're looking through BMX Action, BMX Plus, you're, you're, you know, you're picking out favorite riders, you're, you're cutting them out and you're pasting them on the wall at home because you want to see, you know, look at these guys and what they're doing and know every move they're making and read about their races and their motos and their, their podiums and stuff like that. But you get into the frog towns, you know, this, this resurgence of BMX and especially old school BMX at an old school track. And here's the Buckeye bike show where you're saying, you know, it's, it's more than just a, a, a day to do something. It's a whole event. It's a whole weekend. And now instead of being behind a velvet rope, or looking through a magazine, I can, I can race with Stu or I can, you know, say hi and get an autograph. And it seems like that's really something special. Um, I know in Frogtown, you could, you know, basically watch these guys race and high five them as they, you know, walk back from the finish line back up to the, the top of the hill. So that's where I think, you know, this is so different. This is so much more than just 
you know, sliding a photograph across the table. This is really an event. And we are stoked that you guys are doing this and, and you know, putting this on. And that's something we've been talking about since uh, since you started it. And I'm sorry about the dog. I got a dog parking in the backyard. <laughs> uh, Jamie and Alan, when when is this event? What What's the weekend for this event? It's the first weekend of June. So it's uh, June 2nd, 3rd and 4th. Okay. And then if I want to come, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. So I, I have like Phoenix International Airport. Where do I fly and in, into to attend your event? What's the best big city that's going to connect to a major city? Oh, Dayton International. Dayton. Okay. Yeah. Dayton, so fly you're, you're 15, 15 minutes away. And then the name of the, where, where's the website that's going to have all the information, the hotels, all that stuff? Buckeyebikeshow.com. Buckeyebikeshow.com. I love this. Okay. And then the name of the local track, shout out your track. Uh, Delco, Delco, and it's it's right. an old school BMX track. You know, it's about thousand feet. It's close. You can throw elbows in the corners, and you're around it in about thirty seconds. So it's, I, it's real nice. I love it, brother. Nice, it's compact. I love it. I you know, what's, in, I, what's nice about our, what's, what's nice about our here Dayton is the venue is. Within 15 minutes from the airport, the hotel, the host hotel is within walking distance of the venue. Mm -hmm. And then the racetrack on Sunday is maybe a 15 minute drive. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I mean, right it's all close. I mean, it's boom, right. boom, boom. It's right here. I love that, man. And uh, uh, go ahead, Isaac. I, I'm sorry. I, I, go ahead, bud. One, one more question. What's okay. What's the weather like uh, in June? Because this is a question I didn't ask when SE sent me out to Galveston. <laughs> uh in in august when it was like 120 humidity uh so what's 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 your weather like in june in in around your area i had to be about 82 and humid sunny i love you i love 75 you 75 to 82 75 to 82 somewhere yeah, there. it won't be scorching hot that, that comes in about july but it, it'll be comfortable enough you can race and enjoy enjoy it but see here's the nice thing our venue is inside and it's air conditioning, so it could be 110 outside. Wouldn't matter because we're in air conditioning. Mm -hmm. I'll be I'll be leaving 120 degree heat here in Phoenix to go <laughs> hang out with y'all. So it's good. Uh, so so besides you know the 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 racing, I got to Stu. I want to get back into racing real quick because yeah, uh, we were talking. I was talking with Alan, Alan and and uh, Jamie before you jumped on, and we all I think the whole BMX world saw you post. Hey, I want to race at these races. And it was just like a, the, the USA BMX schedule. Um, yeah. I instantly went down and looked at winter nationals in Phoenix. I'm like, let's go. Can you, what's going on with that? Are you, are you going to do that this year? Are you still going uh, forward with that? Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I think about these things and I, it'd be kind of fun to do it. Um, <clears throat> but I, I would, I, I need a new bike um, to be competitive. Um, obviously the, my, now I wouldn't be riding 24 inch. I wouldn't, I, or cruiser class. I, I don't, I don't feel comfortable racing my 20 inch with the guys out there today because they're still at it and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're good. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think that with the right uh, practice and uh, I don't know what kind of training I would do, but just practice basically track time is what I would need on my 24 inch. Um, I could get up to speed pretty quick but the problem is the str24 is a little heavy at stock it, it's it weighs a lot i can't really modify it too much because it's kind of got old school stuff on it um however um i'm probably gonna reach out to todd lyons and see if i can't get him to send me um another um global flyer and then um I'm going to reach out to Box because I think Box is one of the SE sponsors, and I'm going to see if I can't trick it out a little bit. But as but I've already you know Vegas already hit, and I didn't go to that. Um, I don't know. I just I make I get these ideas in my head, and I, I could do that. I could do this, but then the, it gets closer, and I'm like, oh, I haven't ridden, and I, you know, the last time I rode, I went out to um, Grand Prix BMX, and and sat in on Richie Anderson and uh, Mike Redmond's um, school that they had going on there, their clinic. 
um, and I, I and I brought my twenty inch and and I rode around the track and like after about the fifth or sixth gate start and the pull up over the first couple of jumps, I got a nagging back, not injury but a like a herniated disc or something like that. And there's there's a certain pull or push or something that I do on a BMX track that that aggravates it and I'll start getting muscle spasm. So I got to really be careful. Cause I don't want to, you know, go somewhere and spend a lot of money and a lot of time and energy and then get there and then, you know, have my back jack up. So it's weird. I don't, I don't get it on any of my other cycling. I don't get any road biking. I don't do, it doesn't happen on my mountain bike. It's just when I, it's just a certain pull up or the rhythm or so, I don't know what it is, but it just makes my back hurt. So, um, I don't know. I'll just, you know, Phoenix is the next one coming up after we look at the schedule. I think I took it down off the wall and threw it away because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I got a lot of other stuff going on, you know, in my personal life that also conflict with some of these, you know, ABA races. So, um, but there is going to be another um, Frogtown type event put on by um, um, Dirty Knobs guy. And it's called Dirty Fest and that's going to be in April. And that's at um, Vail, I think it's called Vailocity Bike Park, and it's at Vail Lake in Temecula, and it's going to be a, a two-day event or three-day event and old school racing, just very kind of copycat of Frogtown, because um, I think the I think the idea of that Frogtown event is, is going to blossom and grow, and I think it's going to be, I think there's going to be more independent promoters, and they're going to want to do it in the Midwest or the East coast or, you know, up North or something like that. So I think it's going to create some momentum to get, you know, the fans, the, the yeah. guys that are now 45 instead of 10 um, out there and race and have fun, not necessarily race, but, you know, just, you know, hobnob. Like you said, there's no velvet rope. You know, we just, you know, you, I'm walking up the line, you high five me, you stop, talk, whatever you want to do. Um, but I don't know. I, I still want to do sanctioned race, but I don't know. I, I have a, I, I procrastinate a lot about getting ready for them. I'll tell, um, I'll tell you what, man, I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you the same Craig, I'm going to do the same thing. We did this with the Haro team. So we, the fans wanted to see the Haro freestyle team go out and go again, you know, do another, do another tour. Now that we're, now that we're all old, we were like, let's do it again. So we talked them into starting a GoFundMe to, to do a, where the fans can donate and go, man, we'll go on tour. I would love the opportunity to, to let the fan sponsor Stu Thompson because you have enough fans, dude. I could give you $1 and that $1 goes into a pool that you can then use for hotels. We yeah. can talk to, we can talk to Laird, Mike Laird. And I bet you Todd would tell him it's okay to make a titanium quad angle STR in a 24. I, I dude, it, you of anybody in this industry can, can write a blank check with fans and builders, and we will do anything that you need to get back out so we can see you again. So just yeah. when, you, when you're in your thinking modes, just know that the, it just and then when you wear a jersey, it could have an SE patch, but just put like us. You are sponsored by straight up. Yeah, Japan. I mean, though, I just never sell myself that way. I don't know. I'm just, I just, people always say, oh, you could do this and you could do that, and and you know, you should come out with that and, and sell this. And I'm just like, yeah, I don't know. I just, you know, it's a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy. Um, could I? Yeah, I could, but will I? I don't know. So, well, just I can something say, to you think know, about. <laughs> yeah, oh, and, yeah. And when you do do those things, Stu, or when when you do show up at places like Buckeye or Frogtown, man, we are you know us as fans, we 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 sincerely appreciate your time and uh, effort to get out there. What what are you thinking about this? I don't know. I keep calling it a resurgence of old school BMX and old school BMX related events. Um, how? Uh, I've talked to guys like Miranda. I've talked to, you know, several other uh, guys from your era and hall of famers and legends, uh, you know, with this resurgence, if you want to call it that, what is your, what is your take on this? Obviously I know you're, you're, you're going to these events, you're going to Buckeye, 
But, uh, you know, what does it mean to you? What, what, what draws Stu Thompson into this new, um, you know, resurgence back into old school BMX? Um, sometimes you, I guess it's the old adage, you know, you, 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 everybody gets their 10 minutes of fame, you know, and it's like, well, maybe my, I'm maybe at a, I'm at nine minutes and 45 seconds and I need to do something to get another 10 minutes going, you know? <laughs> so that's what it'll be. So it's like, like, for instance, back, back to a current day racing. Um, the last time I raced competitively was in 2015 when I did uh, three or four ABA nationals. Um, and that's the last time I've really gated up with a full on intent passion to you know go out and 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 win and do you know the, ma the mass racing thing you know frog town and all these other little they're, they're just fun um i think with having the right amount of people that were um influential in the sport back in the you know the 70s 80s you know late 80s early 90s that have a voice like miranda who's still involved in the cycling industry and has the ways and the means to promote this and, and get it, get it going, get the reinsurgence going and, and get invited guests. And, you know, there's, there's, there's only a handful of the old school pros that actually still do some form of riding that, you know, they're not going to go out and, you know, break a neck or they're not, you know, 80 pounds overweight or they have, some kind of medical condition or something like that. There's not, there's only a few of us that are still capable of, of, of doing, doing that. Um, and then there's those that never quit, like, you know, Eric Roop, you know, God, that guy's like never ages, <laughs> you know, unfortunately yeah. we're not in the same cruiser class, so we, we can't race each other. <laughs> Terry, <laughs> Terry Tanette's like that, man. That guy is still just fast. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, when, when I, when I think about like this stuff and I think about that resurgence, Craig, I, I personally love it. I love the resurgence because, but, you know, it, kind of what you touched on, Stu, like I, I'm not as competitive as I was uh, when I was younger. I'm 50. I just turned 50 last month and yeah, congratulations I, on that. Yeah, dude, trust me, bro. I, that's the way I feel. Um, I, I look at it like, there's a couple things that are that's that's happening. I think B, a lot of kids are coming back to BMX because of, and I give credit to Todd Lyons because those the the big ripper having a BMX yeah. bike that I can ride. Uh, because trust me, I still feel like an idiotic twelve year old on a bicycle. My knees yeah. remind me that I'm fifty, but my my brain tells me you, this is you, bro. You remember this is it. Let's go. And I do idiotic stuff, but I also have my wife. Uh, always in my ear and I'm thinking like what's my insurance deductible and if 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 I break an arm like I can't okay. type right it works so so there's always that stuff so my competitive isn't there but what I love is like hanging out with my friends doing BMX stuff and I, I don't care what it is if someone says you want to go to Frogtown yes do you want to go to to Buckeye yes I, I that I just want to go because now I have a better paper route than I did when I was 10 yeah. And I can afford an airline ticket and, you know, I can, I can go and do these things. Um, you know, when, when you're out in, in, in let's say Frogtown and in these events, what's it like for you meeting fans? Is it, is it like, do they just go into stories? Does it, is it nostalgic? What's uh, it like for you? Um, a, a lot of guys will go into stories, you know, they'll say, Hey, you know, I, you know, you, like, like yourself, the story you did, you know, sat on your bike and you had, you know, picture taken and stuff like that. A lot of guys will have the same, same style of story uh, where they've met me in the past, but obviously it's been a lot of, a lot of water's gone underneath the bridges. And, and I don't remember most of that stuff. Um, in fact, there's a lot of, there's a couple guys that, you know, I'm, I got selective memory. I don't, I don't remember a lot of stuff because it was like, <laughs> it's like, okay, you're, you're, a, a full-time factory rider you you're paid to race a bicycle that's your job so you, you get an airline ticket to national x on friday you fly in you rent a car you drive to the track you get some practice in you drive back to the hotel um chit chat bs do stupid things and then you go back to the track you race 
then you're done. You go back to the hotel and you go back to the airport and then you go back home. Then you train for a couple of days. Then you get your next itinerary and then you go to the next track and then you hotel track race home back train back. And you just, you just do that, you know, for 10, 15 years. And it's like, you know, Hey, do you remember, you know, coming out to this track, this track? And like, I don't know. I, you were there, you saw me. So I must've been there or there was a magazine picture of me there and I won or I crashed or finished fifth or whatever. Then, then I was there, but I don't have a lot of attention to details when it, when I try to remember where I went, who I saw, what place I got. It's just, it's just, it's all a fog. Same dude. I, I got to tell you, like, People will ask me like, hey, what bike, what bike, what year is that Haro in that picture that I'm riding? I'm like, I have no idea, dude. I was yeah. 13. I, the, the year yeah. could be whatever. Um, yeah. But I want to, I want to hog one more question out of you more. It's more of a story uh, that, that I think you would enjoy hearing. And this is, so those of you that know, I think most of you know, Stu is a retired law enforcement officer. And you know this, if you're a fan of the show, because we had, another law enforcement officer, Brian Blytheron. And Stu, he told one of the funniest stories I've ever heard. It's his, and and you'll have to forgive me because I don't know some of the, like, whatever his his training officer, it's his first night, first week out, he has a, a, somebody that's watching him to make sure he's doing everything correct. Yep. There is someone, he's he's on the border of a city and, and you guys, Los Angeles is a lot like uh, Phoenix where I can cross the street and I'm in a different city which means different jurisdictions. So yeah. Brian tells the story. There is somebody that's like homeless, drunk, intoxicated across the street in in a different city. He comes over to the park where Brian's at and he's being belligerent. He's like, Blyther, you're Brian Blyther. Recognizes Brian Blyther. He's like, yeah, bro, it's Brian Blyther. Be cool. Go back over there and be drunk over there. He's like, got it. <laughs> Goes across the street, sits down, gets excited as Brian Blyther comes across the street into the other city, gives him a hard time. Brian's off. I, I don't know what is his up-leveled officer, like his sergeant, I'm going to say, is, is like, bro, you got to handle that. <laughs> Not knowing that Brian Blyther is recognizable to us idiot BMX fans. Yeah. So Brian's like, go back. He comes over one more time and Brian's like, done. Cuffs him. And the guy's response was, this is the coolest day of my life. I've now been arrested <laughs> by Stu Thompson and Brian Blyther. So wow. that's just one of the funny stories in BMX. It's just that you guys wow. turned out. So <laughs> that's <laughs> that's funny because I don't I don't remember I don't remember arresting anybody that really knew me. But that doesn't mean that they didn't tell me that they knew me. I don't know, but. Um, I've ran across some people that have, you know, thrown out my name um, or have recognized me, uh, but I don't ever remember arresting them. You know, I remember helping out this one guy and his girlfriend. They were kind of like on, on the border of being homeless and they were kind of hanging out at one of the local convenience stores. And I liked working midnights a lot. So, you know, old dark 30 and, you know, he was, he was uh, coming out of the convenience store and we were chit chatting and stuff and he, he recognized me. And then, I don't know, it's about a year, year and a half later. Um, I'd gotten promoted and, and in our department, every time you get a promotion, they throw you back in jail to be a supervisor or something. And then you, you know, then you promote from there and you go back out in the street. And so I remember I was working uh, back in custody at the jail and, and um, there was a medical issue with one of these inmates. And um, so I went down just to make sure everything was okay. And it happened to be that same guy that I met, you know, in front of the convenience store and, and we chatted and he, you know, he, he, he wanted to thank me for how I treated him, you know, on the street and everything. And, and, uh, you know, he just couldn't change his ways, but, you know, he, he was honored to know me, you know, and, and I, you know, it was kind of cool. Um, I'm glad that I was able to be influential, but unfortunately he just couldn't change his ways because sometimes you just have to pull up stakes and, and you have to get, you know, to, you have to lose your friends. You have to get out of that type of incident and you just need to move on and go somewhere else and start fresh. And, and there's a lot of guys that have done that. And then there's a lot of guys that haven't, but and there was a couple other incidences on the street, you know, a partner of mine pulled a guy over for riding a bike at night, with no lights and stuff. And 
he was throwing out BMX guy names and stuff, and I have to be standing behind him as his backup officer. <laughs> he threw out my name. It was kind of kind of funny. He threw out your name. Yeah, because he goes, <laughs> oh, because he because we he is on some piece of crap ten speed or something like that. And he goes, oh, this isn't the bike I normally ride. I, I usually have a hat. He started throwing out BMX name, you know, GT or something pro this pro that and he goes oh you know and i i knew so and so and i did this and i raced that and, and Stu thompson and this that and then my my partner because he because i'm standing behind the guy and i'm looking at my partner he's in the middle of us and my partner kind of looks over and goes do you hear that and then he turns back to me <laughs> and i kind of walked up behind him and i just kind of pointed at my name badge and he just kind of shut up after that yeah Man, i would too the I, ultimate burn <laughs> dude craig can you imagine like I'll be honest, dude. I, I promise you, a bunch of people recognized you, but like me, dude. If if I got in trouble by Stu Thompson, there's, I would never admit that. Like, oh, dude, I used to BMX. Because can you imagine getting the talk that you're yeah. that, like, I'm disappointed from Stu Thompson, dude. That would suck. That would be the worst. I was yeah, doing a we were, we were doing a traffic break for a, a crash on one of our county highways out in out in the. The foothill areas and i had i had to turn people around they couldn't go through because the road was closed and i was telling this one dude to make a u-turn go back and stuff and he's making a u-turn and he yells two tops and then he takes off you know and i'm like god dang i can't go i can't go anywhere <laughs> but it was cool because a lot of my um uh i can't think of the word i want to use um higher ups you know lieutenants captains assistant sheriffs and stuff like that kn knew me as well through you know their childhood um so it's kind of cool to kind of have a reputation you know it's kind of like the bike guy you know yeah <laughs> yeah that definitely is cool um so you guys out at the buckeye bike show uh coming up um isaac mentioned a a, a ride or you guys mentioned a ride correct can you oh, tell yeah. us and so that you said that that's going to be on Friday. Now I know that you guys have done like a similar ride at each event or at least the last one. What, is there anything changing this year? Is there any type of uh, route or, or different uh, things that are going on with that? Or, or is it pretty much what you guys have been doing? Uh, the route is the same. Um, we're going to push back the time or push up the time. Uh, so instead of starting at seven o'clock, uh, this year we're going to start at eight o'clock <clears throat> and there's no, there's a reason for that. And I'll explain that later. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, we're going to do start it at eight o'clock. This way we'll get into downtown. Um, it's about a three and a half miles into town. So another three and a half back. So the whole ride is like about seven miles, it takes about an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, when we get to downtown, we're going to rest at, um, the Dayton Dragons baseball stadium in front. They're going to congregate, get people to mingle, chat. And then there's a plenty of open area spaces in case guys want to do some tricks and some flatland stuff, kind of show off their skills a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll head back. And by, and by pushing it back from seven o'clock to eight o'clock on our way back, you'll start to see the sunset a little bit. Uh, so when we get back, it'll start to get a little bit dark which is kind of cool because I noticed on some of the other ride outs that I see like on YouTube and whatever, those rides take place at night and, uh, and the city lights and it looks pretty cool. So that's one of the reasons why we're pushing it back, but there's another reason why we are as, as far as scheduling uh, purposes. That sounds like a surprise coming soon. I like that. I like that. Yes. Uh, so what as far as like the bike show and the swap meet what what kind of vendors do y'all have there because i i because if 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 i'm just thinking like ride out i may come and not uh you know smuggle uh, a couple extra dollars that my wife doesn't know that i have to the bike swap meet if that's what's going on tell me about the vendors what is as far as like if i'm going what am i going to experience at that saturday show you're going to see, uh, we have about 30 to 50 vendors who buy tables ahead of time <clears throat> and they load their tables up with old school BMX bike parts. Mm -hmm. So if there's something you're looking for, if you're building a bike and you're missing that one item, chances are you're going to find it 
there at the swap meet. Uh, because they just lay out all their stuff on the tables and it's like, wow, look at this, look at that, look at that. You know, it's like, oh, I need this or I need that. You know, and anything 80s, 90s, you're going to be able to find it. So I love that. It's good because I, I, need, I need the guts to a uh, Bendix for my Emoto Mag. <laughs> <laughs> you might be able to find it. Yeah, it may be there. It yeah. may be there. You yeah, can go you, shopping with Stu. That should be uh, one of the promotions, you know. Go <laughs> table vending with with Stu Thompson. Yeah, <laughs> and we and, could get we could we could do like one of those uh, uh, home and garden shows. I like it. It's, um, I watch a lot of those. I think this one is flea market flip. We can get, we can give a guy fifty bucks and see if they can uh, scavenge enough parts to build a complete bike or something like that. <laughs> Oh, add it on, guys. Easy. Add it on. Yeah, I like. I like where this is going. I like where this is Although going. I don't, think, I, like I don't. I don't think fifty dollars would quite cut it. But you know what I'm saying. No. Something like that. No. It, like like a scavenger hunt. You know. Call who it BMX can, on a bargain. Yeah, who, on a who budget. Can, you know, or get like teams who can throw a front end together. Somebody will work on the middle, and some guy will work on the back end and get together. Or, um, I remember I went. A, I did a, a race once before where. Um, we did, a. Uh, it was, I think it was an NBL race and we had, um, brand new bikes in a box and there was a contest, um, teams who could assemble the bike the quickest from, from opening it out of the box. And I think it was myself and I think it was, um, I think Greg Esser and, um, see if i get this wrong kathy shackle i think when we were introdu introduced or inducted into the mbl hall of fame we did a kind of like a a bike build the three the three of us together we picked someone out of the out of the uh the crowd and, and they were helping us and you know, we put bikes together it was, it was kind of fun too that's crazy dude i i want to ask you one one other question just about like talking about 80 stuff um, as someone that really, my only education about eighties BMX besides Stockton fairgrounds, what was happening there? Like I could tell you about the Anderson brothers, like fighting, you know, like they were crazy and, uh, you know, it was the eighties, you guys. So like it, people, there's fist fights at, at our BMX track all the time. Um, so when I look at rivalries and what I'm learning as I get older and, and I'm not 12 years old, just reading every month, like the catching up on the soap operas of who's sponsored by what the rivalries that we all assumed were super big. Do, were, was it like that in real life or was that Oz pumping up a lot of hype back? That then? was that a lot of that was pumped up, pumped up because I mean, we would, we would pit all like within earshot of each other at all the nationals. And we would race and, and kill each other out on the track. But after the races, you know, we'd be at the hotel where a lot of us would stay and we'd be down at the diner or we were all old enough to drink. So we'd be at the bar or just, you know, shooting the shit and having fun and, and just having a blast. But then you go to the track and it's, it's different, you know, and then it's like, you're my enemy and I'm going to beat you. Or I'm going to put you over the berm or watch out. I'm coming from lane eight to lane one, you know, you know, and you do that. It never really carried over, at least for me and the group of guys that I kind of hung out with, it never really carried over off the track, you know, because what happened on the track is on the track. It, it, nobody really ever took it personal. I don't think. Yeah. It just, but it was, yeah, but it was just, it was, no fights for me. Well, I take that back. There were a couple of scuffles, but <laughs> but nothing. No, no throw. No fist throwing. Yeah. I got a question for you that uh, I need to ask you. I mean, we can all look up a lot of you know. We can a lot of folks who know you or know about you can look up all your accolades, and there's there's just pages and pages. But I have one burning question um, that I just wanted to bring up tonight, Stu. Uh, on my Instagram page, I posted a picture of you, which I post a lot, and, and I'm going to show you the picture, but in it, I'll, I'll set it up real quick. You're, it's it's 1980-ish, early 80s. You had a jacket uh, from, from Redline. It said, Stu Thompson, 1980 ABA number one pro, 1980 BMX A number one rider. And here's the photo. I hope you can, I hope you can see that. 
Yeah, I, I see yeah. that. Yeah, I see it. Can you clear up this controversy or this mystery? Do you know what happened to that jacket or do you still have it? I I thought that I loaned that jacket to my brother, but he says he can't find it anywhere. But I'm going to disappear off screen here for a second. I love when our guests disappear off screen uh, to go look for something, Isaac. And I know <laughs> you love this too, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm about to spotlight uh, Stu's video because I don't want to miss whatever is about to pop up because we're talking. So, Okay, now I oh. have this one here. It's got the exact same embroidery on it, but it doesn't have the red line patch. So I don't know if the patch got taken off. It, it doesn't look like there was a patch. But you know what? It does. There was a red line patch there. Wow. Right. I don't know why I took it off. But yes, you can, on the other side, you can actually see where this, the rectangular stitching is. So this must be the jacket, but the red line patch is no longer there. That is awesome because I asked people on that post, does anybody know what happened to this, this yeah. jacket of stews and no one, I, I don't think I got anybody to answer the question. So thank I still, you. I, I still have it. <laughs> it just, it just doesn't have the red light patch for some reason it was taken off and I don't know why. That's incredible. Thank what? you. Because I, because I remember, the, I remember you posted that picture and I started looking at the, the embroidery on the Stu Thompson part and the plates. And I thought, that's exactly the same as my red line jacket, but this one doesn't have a patch. And now as I'm looking where the red line patch would have been, there's, there's, you can see the actual stitching where, where it used to be and the pad and it's not in any of the pockets. So, but that's the jacket without the red line patch. Same one. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Mystery, so, mystery solved. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and why, why I took the patch off? I don't, I don't know. Cause I wouldn't wear that, you know, on Huffy because you know, I, I think we, now we didn't have our own jackets there. So, but yeah. And I got a couple other cool jackets in my closet too, that I just can't seem to part with. What, well, speaking of that, like, what did you keep? What, what was sentimental enough or, you know, what, what was it that, that you thought, man, this is worth keeping. This is something I want to have. Uh, oops. I kept oh, the lighting in here is kind of bad. I, I, I keep a lot of my name tags and stuff when I go to events, you know, hall of famers and, and legend races. And I, I keep all the hang tags and then some of my trophies for mountain biking and so forth. And then uh, I, I kept most of my, you know, trophies, Nora cup, the brass one. I don't know if the, the let's see if I can turn around, but that one in the middle there, the brass one, that's the Yamaha Gold Cup from 1974. And then and then my red line helmet. Oh. And then and then another Nora Cup trophy. And then just some plaques and I don't know. Nothing really particular. I, I kept a lot of my I, I kept a lot of hats. I've got um oh this is I call this my man room. But I have a, a box of hats, you know, old old hats, you know, Bell yeah. and Essie yeah. Racing and Attic Sprockets and um just old stuff that, that I kept. I don't know why I keep it. You know, I should have kept some of my bikes, but yeah, well, it right. seems to be like a hit and miss because um, I would say it's a 50 50, right, Isaac, on, on our guests that we have on here. And we ask, you know, what did you keep? And some some guys go, I didn't keep a thing. And then we've got guys like Eddie Fiola, who has a whole garage of just, you know, Costco bins, big giant yeah. bins full of uh, uh, of their stuff. And then you you've kept, you know, very important things that were, uh, you know important to you so it's cool to see that you got that what else what else you got i mean i got like i mean i got weird things like this is a little teeny glass trophy and i went it's a mountain bike race and it's like for third place in 1992 but i i just kind of it's just cool you know and then i went back the next year and i got uh i moved up to 
second place. So there's the second place and there's the third place. And then the race went debunked and they didn't race anymore. But I don't know. It's just cool. It's just a big chunk of glass. And I don't know. I kept that. And, you know, it's just some other weird things. But I don't know. I get it, man. I've got, I mean, I've got, I've got trophies behind me that I don't remember. I don't, I couldn't tell you the year, the anything, but it's just, yeah. I remember hanging out with my friends. Well, a friend of mine, friend of mine I went to high school with, his name's Jerry, Jerry Ike Clanton. And he's a direct des descendant of the, the, the Clanton clan from Tombstone, Arizona. And we do a, he, he, he's big into the motorsport industry. He does a lot of announcing for Speedway Motocross or Speedway down in Costa Mesa Speedway. And he does some uh, color commentating for the Long Beach Grand Prix. And he just knows a lot of the motorsport industry guys and flat trackers, um, guys like Bubba Schobert, Kenny Roberts. And, and he's the you know, curator and owner of the, um, the Haunted Hotel in Tombstone, Arizona. Well, they've had this motorcycle event telling me low battery so I might have to find my charger um he's got this motorcycle event that he puts on every year in tombstone arizona and he invites me and i'm i'm like the the, the token non mx dude you know I'm, I'm a bicycle rider but we we went to high school together and we raced high school motocross together and stuff like that and we had a blast um so he invites me to these races and last Last, uh, last November, myself and um, go big time motorsport dude, Gary Denton, I think it was, yeah, Gary Denton, were the honorary um, MCs of the, or what were they, I don't know what we are. Anyways, I got a key to a Tombstone, key to the city in a proclamation. What? And a, and a proc and an uh, approximation, I think that's what they call them, approximation, something like that from the mayor, you know. And, yeah, proclamation. And, yeah. Proclamation. Yeah, proclamation. So it's the city of Tombstone, Arizona. I got the the key to the town. So that's cool. So uh, these, that these is cool. and these are things that are still happening. You know, I'm like 64 years old now, and, and I'm still getting recognized for my contribution to BMX. And that's and that's the thing, and that goes back to a kind of a question I don't really think I answered fully Isaac or yeah Isaac about um what it's like when the, the when we talk to the fans and stuff and and for me it's awe-inspiring and it's humbling it's humbling to know that me I made an impact on somebody's life in our little short span of us meeting and I just, I, I feel blessed every day that people like Jamie and, and Alan think of me in a regard to where they want to bring me out to the Buckeye Bike Show to be their guest of honor. Um, just recently, last year, I did the, the Mighty Most um, BMX Cruise, you know, as the, the guest of honor there. Um, been to Australia twice. And these are all when I'm in my 60s. So I'm like, holy crap, you know, it's like, I, I I'd never I never thought that that's what this would lead to, um, but it's but it's humbling to say the least. Well, let me let me ask you this, because it, it kind of it segues into this question. Um, you know, when you look back and I see all these Nora Cups and and you know you're showing showing these trophies and things you kept. When you look at this, okay, first of all, like I'm going to ask you to kind of go back and put yourself in, you know, twenty year old Stu's mind. When you look when when you look back at, at early BMX, could you even did you even think we would be Olympic sports? Did you think it was going to be you would be talking to fans that were ten years old? Uh, you know, back then is is did it dawn on you that it would be this successful and it would be this big? I don't. I, I think if if I was if I was back at twenty four years old, do I think it would have gotten this big? I I I knew that it would have stuck around um because i did a, a couple interviews before you know in my prime and people were saying you know do you think bmx will be in the olympics well at the time um there were no professional athletes allowed in the olympics it was strictly amateur and you know we were 
paid professional. So like, no, I don't think the MX in, in our level will ever be in the Olympics because the Olympics in, in its um, design was for amateur athletes, the best, you know, the best of the amateurs and pros were not allowed to compete in the Olympics. Well, that changed. And obviously you have, you know, now, you know, BMX in the Olympics, but at the time, you know, no professionals were allowed in the Olympics. So I think I answered half the question. The other half just went. Let me, let me, I'll, I'll, are you proud of where, are you proud of where it went? That would be, I guess that would be the final for me on that. On yeah, that one. yeah, because I mean, it's still a, an, an out for a lot of kids. Um, they don't, I don't, I can't, I don't follow it as much. So I don't know, you know, kids, did they, do you, you know, like we rode our bikes everywhere all the time and obviously society's changed and you know it's it's unsafe for kids to go out at you know two three o'clock in the morning and rip around town and and jump curbs and you know get chased and stuff like that um that doesn't happen but i think it's become a sport where someone could say i, you know, I want to do this and then and i think a lot of it has to do with the parents as well because they they may have been involved into it in some form or fashion and they wanted an outlet for their kids. Um, but I'm glad that it continued. Um, it has progressed and gotten, um, I think more, um, more mainstream. It's still a sport that's hard to um, advertise and draw spectators to because it lasts so long. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, and that's and that's the only drawback that I think that, you know, and then they tried to, do, you know, get into more mainstream. And that's how X Games came across and and stuff like that, because of more extreme sports, because, you know, they, everything now is, you know, almost called a BMX. You know, you know, I remember I was watching the, the UCI World uh, Pump Track Championships earlier or later last year. And. Before it was all mountain bikes, and now the top sixteen riders, there were no big wheel bikes, and they're all they were all twenty inch BMX bikes. Yeah. So you know that that changes things, um, but they still call it BMX. You know, so I mean, is BMX does it have to be a twenty inch bike? Can it be a twenty four inch bike? Can it be twenty six? Can it be twenty seven five? Can it be twenty nine? You know, I think it's what you want to do with the bike is, you know, if you want to do a wheelie on it and jump a curb, then uh, em emulating a, a, a jump of some sort, it's it's bicycle motocross. Yeah, I I, mean, I couldn't agree more, brother. I mean, that's that 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 is the current debate right now. Like, what do we call us? Like, even even uh, you know, I've I've Mike Mike Buff gives me a hardest time about about the name of my podcast. He's like, you call it Big Bike BMX, but you talk to old school flatland freestyle old school racers from the 80s and then you talk about big like bike life and you know i i just we don't we're struggling for an identity ourselves because it's when i say us we like us us old like our the dads that are coming back the 80s bmx kids are looking up redline they're looking up se they're looking up these bikes that we all wanted as kids buying them as big bikes because they don't hurt our knees and to us it's bmx but to yeah. like you know a flat like if i talk to the the afa the american flatland association they're like oh it's tw 20 inches is bmx 20 anything yeah. 20 anything bigger than 20 inches not bmx so yeah, it's, I, it's just you don't have an I identity don't, you, yeah. you can't i don't think you can you can't label it like that it's, i agree it's 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 what it's you know run with your bro you know I mean, I remember, I remember there was a track I grew up on racing called Western Sports Arena, WSA. And I had a five-speed, uh, ten. well, you know, it's not a ten-speed because it's only five, but I only had five gears on it. It had, you know, flat bars on it and a big padded seat on it and, you know, inch and eight <laughs> tires you know, 27, 27 inches steel <laughs> and I'm out freaking jumping that thing and having a blast because, yeah. 
I mean, who cares? You know, it's just like motocross. You know, you, you've got, um, you know, the, the the little mini, the little minis, the little fifties, and then you have seventy five, then eighties, then you have a hundred, then you have one twenty five, then you had two fifty, and then you had five hundred. I mean, it's like all oh, all motocross, just different CCs. Right. So can can you know, you the CC is a wheel size. That's you know, it's the only thing. Right. So now you have you know, let's say a, a a 125 would be like a 20 inch wheel and then a 250 would be like a cruiser and then a 500 would be like a 29er so it's like it's still you're still doing what you're doing you know and would you be doing that if you didn't have bmx in your blood you know is some guy who is a stock trader someday going to just walk into a bike shop and say hey i want to buy you know brand x 29 inch bike and i just want to go right around the street Oh, is he is he a BMXer? Probably not. But the guy that you know was 10, 12 years old and racing, and then got out of it, had a career, you know, worked in construction or was a whatever, and then you know, forty five years later, he he's like, eh, I kind of want to get into this again. But you know, that seventeen inch top tube bike that he had don't fit, or you know, it's in a landfill somewhere rusting. <laughs> um, but look, this company makes a, a bigger version of that bike. So why knock him for wanting to do what he did as a, as a kid? It's poor kids, man. It was like, Oh yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> no, those... I mean, I, I would get, I would probably go through more wheels only because, um, you know, you, you've seen some of the action saw uh, action shots, you know, in some of these corners and, you know, you get some guys, you know, you come up behind somebody a little too fast and you get that rear axle in your front wheel and you can take out a few spokes really fast. Um, so yeah, wheels, you know, I, I replaced wheels a lot. Um, cranks, um, you know, I, I broke a few pair of red lines, but, um, for the most part, they were, they were pretty rock solid cranks. Yeah. Uh, and it was always a defect that was un, unseen until it was, got back to the laboratory and they x-rayed it and then they found out that you know there was a gap in the weld or uh, a, bl a blip in the oxygen acetylene or whatever you know some something happened that created that failure you know it wasn't yeah. like i broke it through the trash i'd give it back to lynn lynn had sent it back to japan they they would go over it and they'd find out why it failed and either either it was a uh, a problem during manufacturing or there was a, a problem in the design and one way or the other it got fixed yeah i think you know, we were all things... just kind of doing that then i think like well, yeah. like with parts dude i mean the the dropouts were like paper thin on, oh, yeah. on all of our bikes you know and it was just kind of like i feel like we were all beta testers for the most mm -hmm. part just because it was so cutting edge it was so new like if your dad had a blowtorch like you were the block god because you could like chop up your bikes and like yeah. you know it was that kind of stuff. Oh, well, that's what I. That's how I modified my Schwinn Stingray that way. You know, my dad had tools galore, and you know I knew how to arc weld and acetylene torch and all that stuff when I was probably twelve. You know, so I was doing all kinds of weird stuff to my bike. Yeah, that's, I mean, I wish I had that skill at 12 and kids today, you know, maybe that's something they can work on. Um, speaking of that, Stu, you mentioned earlier, well, before you were heading out to get your charger, I wanted to in on a final thought here. It, it was really about uh, something you had said about, you know, you have, you were just, you know, kind of blown away about the impact that you've had um, in, in your career, especially today with, you know, talking to guys and folks out there who, who come out to these events and stuff. And one of the things I want you to think about too, and I'm, I don't know if you have, but I'm, I'm sure it's been on, you know, something that you could think about while you're shoveling your driveway of snow there. But, uh, you know, my son, my son, when I got back into BMX and especially on the bigger bikes that we're riding now, um, one of the bikes I picked up was a 24 inch SE racing STR one, the Stu Thompson replica. And my son asked, he goes, dad, who's, who's Stu Thompson. So we were talking about you and I was showing him pictures. Cause I have the Instagram account and all these things. Right. And we, then we plopped in Joe kid on a stingray. And my son was instantly like engulfed in old school BMX, Stu Thompson's number one. 
Um, I think he said something like, you know, the best rider ever and the Tony Hawk of beer. He just had all these things and he was really involved. So not only does it have an impact on guys like Isaac and I and Jamie and Alan, but, you know, we're taking our kids to Frogtown. We're taking our kids to um, to the uh, the BMX Grands and, and we're letting them watch this stuff. But, you know, having them involved in, in, in you know, checking out our, our magazine collections and stuff, it brings this whole new generation into the fold. And they kind of get an idea of what we got to see as kids. And not only that, where the roots of what they're watching in today's Olympics and today's X games and, you know, where does that come from? And so it's, I want to say thank you for that impact that you were talking about because it's going generational now. And so that's a big deal to me. And I'm, and I know Isaac with his kids and Jamie and Alan and all those things that that's the, one of the best things as, as far as a parent or a dad who's still involved with bikes can you know, the biggest compliment I can give you, thank you for that impact that, that you gave us. Uh, I, I appreciate it. Um, and it's, like I say, it's, it's, uh, it's a humbling experience to be thought of in a sport that I believe is still super small, um, but an impact to many people um, throughout the whole world, you know, during my racing career, I've impacted a lot of people and, um, I would say it's just probably within the last maybe five or six years that it's really been an eye-opening experience realizing the impact that I had. Before it was just like, ah, I just ride bikes. You know, I'm just some dude on a bike, you know, or paraphrase the the actual title, Joe Kid on a Stingray. Because um, that's that's all I was. And that's, you know, and, and I believe that's how Mark Eaton and John Swore came up with the title because we, we were doing it they were doing an interview in my garage in my house and, and, and I, we didn't know what the name of the movie was going to be, you know? And I said, you, you know, I was just some 14 or 15 year old. I was, I said, I was just Joe kid on a stingray. And that's what I told them. The next thing you know, they make it, you know, Joe kid on a stingray. I, uh, I didn't get any props for that, but that's all. Right. <laughs> we know where it came from still. Yeah. Bro, yeah. I got, I got chill. Just hearing you say, I, I was just joking on the stink. Cause that's like, so everyone talks about like, okay, we got rad, but like our history Bible is Joe kid on the stingray. And so to hear you just say that dude yeah. is just like yeah. mind blowing rad. to me. Rad. I don't, I don't think, I think it was probably maybe five years ago. It was the first time I ever watched rad. And I was like, Oh my God. Sorry. Wow. Wow. Sorry for anybody that was involved in that movie, but that was bad. Oh my, he, he, yeah, no. my, that was I mean, but you know what? It it promoted the sport and people like, you know, God rest his soul, Rennie Roker. He was involved in the industry in a way that he was in the mo he was in entertainment business and he did BMX racing and you know that's how you got chips and all those BMX episodes in the movies and stuff like that you know with et and rad and and all those chip movies we're talking just it was just those are influential people that maybe they planted a seed into somebody and you know they became the next you know amateur champion or uh, expert category writer some point in their life before they went on to do something else and Hopefully the work ethics that it took them to get to that point carried on in their life as an adult and let them progress and become a champion in life rather than just in racing. A hundred percent. I, I say this all the time. Uh, I tell Craig's probably like blue in the face hearing the story, but I always say like, I, I always, I'm a big, I'm a big like helmet preacher. I always talk about wearing helmets because the same, like us 80s kids, we we picked two specific sports, BMX, which was a repetitive, a little bit fine, like just a little bit fine tuning every time you did it. And it was just a life of, of being very lonely and very uh, solitary game. Skateboarding was the exact same thing. Uh, it was doing something, failing, figuring out why I failed. Why did I fail? Why did I fail? This little bit of balance, this little bit of change will be the thing that does it. And it's that kind of thinking that will cure cancer, that will cure Alzheimer's. It's yeah. that that continuous failure 
but seeing it as progress, not I'm giving up. And so that's that's one of the main things that I think BMX gave to the world and early gave to, to us as lifetime riders. That's the same principles I did in flatland freestyle when I was a kid is the same thing I'm doing now as an adult in my career, even though it's not BMX. It's experiment, fail, experiment, fail, experiment, fail. And eventually you win. And that's how you progress and get better. It's the same exact concepts that I learned on a bike. And that's why I love this sport and, and, and people like yourself that taught us the way, like it, it was, it, you know, it wasn't, we were lucky in the eighties that we didn't have these like preachy influencers. We had a bunch of dirt bags that were yeah. just making it, making it work. And everybody had neighborhood legends and we just had really great ones that picked BMX. And yeah. it gave us something to aspire to because I, I couldn't like, I could get into trouble because I was too busy at the track. I was too busy in a field. Like I couldn't go smoke weed with my, with my friends that were in the neighborhood because I'm borrowing a shovel to go build, you know, jumps because at some point I have it in my mind that I too can jump over a Porsche uh, yeah. because you, you know what I mean? Or, or you know what I mean? And, and it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be that guy. Like that's, I'm well, going to, that, I mean, you, you, that's where you make a conscious decision um, on, you know, in my life, am I going to make that left turn or am I going to go right? And I know a lot of guys have made that, that left or wrong turn or right turn, whatever, what do you, however you want to analogy it. Some guys went the wrong way. And, you know, some of us went the right way. Some of us are just straight true down the middle and we're good. But I mean, for me, I was lucky. I mean, I had a good solid family raising you know, good parents, you know, Scott Brighthop was a great sponsor. He had a vision. Um, I was the tool for one of his products. So, you know, radio interviews, um, television interviews, learning how to speak and talk with people, you know, same with Lynn Caston, you know, he was a businessman and I was a business tool for him to promote Redline. So it was taking classes on how to communicate with people in college, um, learning how to speak, you know, eloquently somewhat. I, you know, I still kind of screw that up, but being able to, sell a product that would help pad his wallet, which would pay me to promote his product, which in just a big, big circle. And those two sponsors that I had were probably that good parents set me up for my life because they, they instilled good work ethics and that carried on you know, through all the little menial jobs that I had. I had a bike shop and that's not a menial, but I had a bike shop for eight years and my wife and I ran. And then I figured that, you know, being your own boss, it wasn't all that cool. So I decided to get a job in law enforcement where someone else would pay me and work for the government. Um, and that turned out to be 24 years. And, you know, that was the best thing that happened to me too, because it instilled, it, it instilled good work ethics for me. And, and the same thing, I, I treated people with respect, whether it was at the BMX track or if it was at my bike shop helping somebody behind the counter or in law enforcement dealing with, you know, somebody who just, you know, had their car broken into and I got to take a report or their their um, their 98 year old Alzheimer's parent has walked away from the house and they don't know where they are and you got to help them find them. And, and there's just the whole, you know, it's just not all about shooting and, and beating people up i mean there's you know it's there's just more to it than that yeah 100 percent. yeah i i gotta tell you thank you so much dude for hanging out and for giving us your time yeah. thank you for for every bmx memory i have uh and and the stuff that i remember dude it's i i couldn't it's not the races it's the my all-time favorite stew picture we were talking about it because jamie and alan have have we were talking about right before you got on that 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 the, the stomp and stew poster behind them is, is one of Craig's favorites. Mine is uh, you're, it's a black and white photo. You're in a garage and you're in leathers. You're, you're it's, it's the SE era, no shirt on. And you're, you're by, there's just four or five bikes upside down and you're tightening some kid's wheel. You're working on some other kid's bike. And to me, that that's the most like BMX moment when you have someone that, that I see is, stomp and stew helping some kid 
in you know 1980 something like i had some some joe kid on a stingray teaching me how to grease my hubs and how to tighten the cones so just thank you for everything that you did for bmx thank you for all of it dude i i we wouldn't be here uh if you didn't do what you did so thank you so much for everything only appreciated thank you very much and I think that was Bicycles and Dirt was the magazine cover on that one. Oh, dude, I got, I'm going to look it up because I'm going to get it printed and I'm going to send it to you. I'm going to get your address. I'm going to send it to you. I probably got the, that's, I got a whole sh sh slew of magazines over there. It's probably alphabet, alphabetized in there. I can probably find it in about four minutes, but. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, Alan and Jamie, you guys, thank you so much for what you do for BMX. Thank you for just the opportunity uh -huh that you provide for people like Craig and myself and all of the people that listen to this, this podcast, thank you for giving us a congregating spot where the magazines come to life, where I can go. It's a bike show. It is a ride out. It's a meet and greet. It's a race. It's literally a living magazine. Nice. Thanks for creating that for us guys. Hey, no problem. You're welcome. Yeah. We appreciate oh, cool. it. Craig. Any you know, final questions for uh, for Jamie Allen or Stomp and Stu? Uh, you know, I just want to, I don't have any final questions, but uh, again, I'll, I'll echo Isaac's sentiments. And to close out, I will say thank you so much to you, uh, Jamie and Allen, for showing up here, for representing the big, or the Buck High uh, bike show out in Ohio. You guys are just, you guys are helping guys like Isaac and I relive not only our childhood, but to continue on this, uh, you know, amazing sport that we're involved with into our adulthood years. Uh, keep doing it. You guys know that we, we really love what you're doing and can't say thank you enough for doing what you guys do. Uh, can't wait to be a part of it and come see you guys out in Ohio. Uh, for our special guest tonight, uh, Stuart Thompson. Stu, thank you so much for showing up here, for giving us your time, for for, uh, you know, sharing with us not only the stories, but the things that are important to you still in BMX and, and what's uh, what's going on with you and that you're still involved, that you're still participating. Um, we really appreciate you for that. And uh, everyone out there listening right now to Big Bike BMX, if you're in the live chat and you've been having a good time, go ahead now and hit that uh, subscribe button, like and follow. If you like what we're doing here, we promise we're bringing you more content this year. We're bringing you uh, more shows and we thank you from the bottom of our heart for showing up here with us at Big Bike BMX. You guys, this is 80s BMX. Craig Isaac, I'm going to send it back to you. I'm out. You guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We love you. We we appreciate all of you in the live chat. We appreciate you for hanging out. We appreciate you for riding your bikes. Thank you, Mr. Stu Thompson, Jamie Allen. We will see you in June. We're going to check out the BuckeyeBikeShow.com website and i'll put all of the contact information on the screen right now do a screenshot so you have it reach out to jamie now and if you have questions they're great guys and you'll make some new bmx friends even if you're not going to buckeye make sure you follow their instagram follow their facebook and hang out with these guys you're gonna love them if you like us you're gonna love jamie now too you guys have a wonderful night thanks